This episode of Juice Guru Radio is brought to you by Try Best, making healthy living easy. Well, welcome. Welcome to Juice Guru Radio. Discover what the magic and power of juicing can do for you. And now, your host, best selling author of The Complete Idiot's Guide to Juice Fasting, Steve Prusak. Well, hello, I'm Steve Prusak. Welcome to the show. We've got Elisa Fleming. She's the founder of GoDairyFree.org, leading website for dairy-free living. We're going to find out why we might want to give up dairy. So get yourself some water, some tea, some juice. We'll be back right after this with Elisa Fleming. Here's another Juice Guru approved product. Hey there, Juice Guru tribe. If you're anything like us, you want to eat as much raw enzyme rich food as possible. We find that when you eat this way, you'll have boundless energy. Here at Juice Guru, we choose to use the Sedona Express Dehydrator to create delicious raw food crackers, chips, gourmet nuts, and cookies. Just recently, Steve whipped up a batch of dehydrated kale chips for the crew, and they tasted incredible. Order your own Sedona Express at the Juice Guru Tribe discount price by visiting our website at juiceguru.com. The Sedona Express makes healthy living easy. Get one today. Juice Guru Radio. And welcome back to the show. I'm Steve Prusak. So excited. We've got Elisa Plumbing here. Like I said, she's the founder of GoDairyFree.org, helping tons of people all over the world with this message. And her new book, it's the second edition of Go Dairy Free and her brand new cookbook, Eat Dairy Free, available at bookstores worldwide. Let's welcome to the show right now, Elisa Fleming. Hi, Hi Steve. Elisa. So nice to be here. Well, thank you for joining us. And uh, I said bookstores worldwide, but this book's available on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, and your website too, right? Uh, well, th- um, not directly from me, but yes, I do uh, send people to the right places to get it. <laughs> Very good. Well, let's talk about why we might even want the book before we mention the book. And uh, talk to us about your journey about you know why we might want to consider giving up dairy and some of the dangers that we might not be aware of. Oh, that's a good question. It's a dairy is a much bigger topic, I think, than people realize. Um, and I think it, it touches it, it hits home for people in a lot of different ways. Uh, my my own personal journey uh, started w- with a milk allergy as a, as a child. And um, I didn't outgrow that. It just transformed into something a lot more problematic later in life. And uh, so I really found myself kind of thrust into it uh, quite a while before even the vegan movement really took hold, um, which is why I started this was just to provide information. Back in that day, I think there was one soy milk brand up on the top shelf in the dairy department and nothing else. So <laughs> it was a bit of a bit of an uphill climb. But now there's just so, so much more information, so many more products. And I think people are gaining awareness. What are the dangers of dairy? Uh, what are some of the things people find if they consume too much of it? Um, I think for a lot of people, health issues are the first things that come into play. Um, we think we think mostly in the immediate sense a lot of times. So for people um, who are noticing a lot of digestive issues, it could be some. It could be lactose intolerant. It could also be something more severe, like a. Um, uh, a non IgE type of allergy or, or an IgE type of allergy, both of those types people don't realize affect the digestive tract. Um, they think of it just as hives and anaphylaxis, but actually um, allergies can affect the digestive tract. And so those can be signs of lactose intolerance or of something more serious, which is why some people don't get relief when they try lactose free milk. Um, that's one of the major things right away. Um, there's also a, uh, I keep seeing um, getting reports of headache relief, migraine relief, um, all types of skin condition symptoms. Acne is a huge one. A lot of dermatologists recommend going dairy-free as a first line of defense when they've got skin conditions like eczema, acne, psoriasis, that kind of thing. And um, those are some of the more immediate, like instantaneous gratification things um, in terms of when people cut out dairy. Some other things that people see a lot are or might be reading about more and more is kind of the long term effects of dairy consumption and uh, the increased risk of hormonal cancers. Uh, More recently, reports of Parkinson's disease correlations between it, as well as um, 
just uh, it's surprisingly osteoporosis, bone fractures, that kind of thing. So it's there, there's a lot more involved in it, I think, than people realize in terms of both short term and long term benefits. Was there a problem with the way the animals are treated, like they're using hormones and uh, growth hormones, like I was going to say, and mm -hmm. genetic engineering and all those different things? Is that attributing to some of the problems people are experiencing now? It could be. I mean, there's not a lot of uh, great research to say exactly why things like hormonal cancers are on the rise. Of course, they do speculate the added hormones, but um, but they haven't been able to directly correlate to to that. And I think what people don't realize is that beyond the added hormones, the dairy actually has its own hormones too. <laughs> so it could also be the naturally occurring hormones in the dairy. As we um, get older, our bodies don't need those injections of hormones to grow. And um, so it's, it's likely the added hormones are an issue, but it could also be the naturally occurring hormones too. I mean, isn't it true that humans are really one of the only species that will continue to drink milk from another animal well into our adulthood when typically this it's designed for a baby calf? I, I believe so, yes. I mean, you'll hear a lot of people argue if you put milk in front of a cat, it will eat it. And that's true. Um, I mean, I've, I've seen lots of cats that'll drink milk if you put it in front of them. I think there are a lot of creatures that would drink it, but we're the only ones who seek it out and you know, make it a, a daily habit. Now, historically, in some of the health books, I'll see things like recommendations for raw goat milk, saying that that's a step up in, um, in, in dairy. Is there any benefit to people consuming things like that? The reason some of the doctors say it is because uh, goat milk proteins are slightly closer to um, breast milk, human breast milk proteins than cow's milk proteins are. So there are, there's a percentage of people that tolerate um, or are not allergic to goat's milk that are allergic to cow's milk. And so that's, the protein is slightly better, but in terms of saying it's, it's not dairy or it's, you know, could never produce any of the problems, that's definitely would, would be a false claim. Uh, a lot of people who have problems with, with cow's milk, most of the people who have problems with cow's milk have a problem with goat's milk too, but there definitely are some variations that affect people differently. Now, another thing, another argument might be that if you drink it raw, that there's more beneficial. I've seen health food stores offering raw dairy products, and people seem to really be gravitating around that. What do you think about that? And is there anything to prove that that also is not the best food for human consumption? Um, as I mentioned before, it doesn't have, um, it, it has the benefits of not being pasteurized or homogenized. Um, homogenization has loosely been linked to some certain, um, you know, health issues loosely. They, there's not a lot of strong correlation there. It's kind of more of the cause and effect sort of thing in terms of studies. Um, and there wouldn't be the added hormones, which there also isn't in organic milks. But in terms of saying that people wouldn't be allergic to it, that it wouldn't cause lactose intolerance issues, those are not true claims. Um, that Those things can't be claimed. Um, and raw milk also runs the issues in which it, of the regulations. And it's not even legal in a lot of states and it can't be taken across borders. So you can't order it from one place to another. And it, and it still does contain all of those naturally occurring hormones that are in milk. It's, there really haven't been enough studies to say that, or many studies at all on raw milk. You know, it doesn't have the same funding as, as the pasteurized milk to promote its benefits over pasteurized homogenized milk. And can they, in fact, be um, harmful bacteria and thing like that, things like that in the raw milk since it's not pasteurized? There can be, yeah. And, and that's why it's, it's not legal in a lot of states. And people will argue about the, the, um, whether or not any type of milk is safe, but, but they do have extra concerns with the raw milk because it isn't pasteurized. And what about organic? Some people will say that, you know, if they have organic dairy, it's a step up from the conventional. And what would you say about that? Um, it doesn't have the added hormones. And the feed is mm. most likely um, different. Um, right. I was going to say, like, for the eggs, they'll have free range. And yeah. it makes a difference between the factory farmed eggs. And, and if there is a difference in that for people to know. That's, that's another thing where I've read the studies in terms of health. I haven't seen a big wow moment with organic or raw milk saying that, you know, they, they prevent 
things that regular dairy causes that they they definitely are still problematic for people with lactose intolerance and milk allergies. They're um, I think I think people who ethically give it up would still have to consider is organic milk still qualify ethically for what for what they want. A lot of times it's just different feed and no hormones. It's not any different than factory farming, but um, in some cases it is a lot better. But to to make any health claims on that, I haven't seen organic milk being able to make any health claims beyond it doesn't have the added hormones and it is certified organic through the process. So now when we're talking about dairy, we're talking about milk, cheese, are we talking about eggs too? Does that fall into a dairy category as eggs a standalone kind of thing? Eggs is definitely a standalone. Uh, it doesn't, it, it isn't dairy. And I always, I always uh, refer people to, you know, the dairy council, they don't manage eggs, they manage milk products. You know, I think people have been confused over the years because they're lumped into the same department. Um, also, you see a slightly higher rate of egg allergies with milk allergies, but they don't directly correlate. There's just hmm. a slightly higher rate of um, egg allergy among people with milk allergies than the, than the general population. Um, so, so do they- you talk about eggs since it's outside your niche? I mean, can we include eggs in what we're talking about here today or no? Um, you can, it's definitely not dairy, but because I do address the plant-based community a lot and because I deal with the food allergy community a lot, I do a lot of egg-free recipes, egg-free testing. I actually just put up a big egg substitute post the other day. So, okay. Cause I, it's funny. I always think about, I, I just lump them together for some reason. I don't okay. know if everyone else does or just me, but maybe cause it's a breakfast kind of thing like milk and even though Thank cheese you. really isn't. Yeah, I, I think um, I think there's just so many reasons we put them together. But in terms of their their makeup, uh, eggs are actually a bit more like meat than milk, and so they're they're not really um, that similar to milk in any particular way. But but definitely societal wise, we sort of just put them together all the time. And and obviously, if people are vegan, that's the two elements beyond meat that they're giving up. So I think again, they get lumped together there too. You know, and there are some people in the health uh, world that would say, or health proponents that would say that eggs are one of the most perfect foods that a human could eat. Um, is there anything to back that up? Any science, anything you found in the science? Because you've done a lot of research on all this. Gosh, I haven't done as much research on eggs, I have to admit. So I, I couldn't say scientifically if there's been any real, you know, eggs is a perfect food. I, I do know that they, um, egg allergies can be an issue for many, but I, I don't know in terms of, um, I think you run into the same problems like you were talking with how they're produced and everything, but I don't, I couldn't speak to that. I have heard that myself too, though, that they're the the perfect food. (laughs) But also from an animalistic thing, I mean, we are animals as humans. Are there any other animals that will eat the egg of another animal? I I believe they do. I think so, but I'm speculating here, but I actually believe there are ones that do eat the eggs of others. It's interesting. As humans, it seems like we'll eat just about anything. I I was in an Asian market. They have fungus and mold that people will eat. It's very interesting, isn't it? Yeah, a lot of it goes beyond (laughs) what I want to eat, I'll be honest. People will eat anything. So here we're hearing there are benefits to it limiting or giving it up. So eliminating it or just limiting it. And uh, what are some more of the benefits so someone could say, you know what, at least I'm going to give this a try because you're saying I'm going to feel better, I'm going to clear up my acne, I'm going to uh, lose weight. What are some of the other benefits if, if someone's watching that we can say, you know what, you might want to give this a try? Oh, gosh, you mean you mean other types of things beyond uh, like similar well, to I know a lot of my friends watching right now might even just be vegetarian and uh-huh. they, like, they like a lot of dairy. So what might we tell them, you know, if you try to limit it or give it up, here's what, here's what else you might experience. Um, I do know there are a lot of people, um, at least anecdotally that I've been told that, that uh, gain a lot more energy um, from, from cutting out. It's the, a lot of people refer to it as heavy food. Um, there also a lot of people get sinus relief. Um, a lot of people have congestion from it. So a lot of times, um, I, I even remember when we went to an ENT doctor and, and one of the first questions with a lot of health issues, everyday health issues that we don't think about, the doctors will ask these days is, do you consume dairy? It's very interesting. This is 10 years ago. I never saw this, but even the ENT, you know, it was like, well, do you consume dairy? Because um, a lot will say that the studies are very weak 
between um, congestion issues and dairy, but a lot of people will tell you they're not. <laughs> so it's, and, and a lot of doctors too believe that there is some sort of correlation because a lot of people see that link. And I think right now with all the hay fever, a lot of people could use a little relief. Um, definitely um, a lot of people do see weight loss when they cut out dairy. Why? I'm not exactly sure, but a lot of people do see that happen. And um, I think just generally feeling better. There, there are some very, um, if you're interested, there are some very strange, um, uh, 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 what I'm trying to say, symptoms that I have seen with it, with dairy. If you're interested, they're not your everyday kind of conditions. Um, but one of them is, I don't know if you've heard of narcolepsy. Yeah, I've heard of it. Okay, it's it's uh, extreme tiredness, suddenly falling asleep. Um, right. Quite a few people actually have it. I had it myself, and oh, wow. uh, I get when I quit dairy, it it was instant. I, I had a very uh, fairly severe case of it, and it was just instantly disappeared. I thought I was crazy because there was no studies out there on it. You know, you're always looking for proof. And um, but I've had several people over the years come to me and say it cured their narcolepsy. Um, so some people, and I have had other people who say uh, it got rid of their sleepiness, which could be mm. related to that somehow. Mm. Um, also for myself and several family members, it plummeted our cholesterol, just plummeted it, just, I mean, decimated it. I had a cholesterol of 240 with the the bad cholesterol, you know, LDL of like 200 overnight, 100 points gone, literally overnight, never went back up. And uh, family members have had the same thing. So there's just all these little things, I think, that you don't think about that food can possibly affect, be affecting you. No, yeah, okay. it did the same thing to me with, with the cholesterol. Definitely brought my cholesterol down. It was high, even though I thought I was eating healthy way back. Yeah. Um, amazing. So someone might be saying now, okay, I'm going to try and give it up. And there's so many options now. If you go in the store, there's from soy milk to almond milk, hemp milk, all these different kinds of replacements and, and, and pseudo cheeses and things, which we didn't have years before. Yeah. What are some of the replacements and what are some of the benefits of those? And also I wanted to ask you about soy milk because there's a lot of controversy in soy and if soy milk is actually a health food or not. Do you want me to start with soy? Let's, uh, you know, I know there's like four questions in one. <laughs> so, okay. Let, let, well, let's start with the replacement milks. But yeah, let's okay. starting with soy milk. Is soy milk a good alternative? I actually believe it is to a certain extent. Um, I think, I think the anti-soy movement when it came in was because we were just bombarded with soy alternatives. There were people who were intaking, you know, five, six servings of soy a day, and and really intaking one food as your primary food it may not be such a good idea they you know um it, but and also because of the way that we produce soy and how it's used how it's extracted all of those issues started factoring into it the the, the fact of the matter is even with the anti-soy books out there all of the studies are done on soy protein isolates high quantities of soy protein isolates they haven't found issues with whole soy or whole organic soy so in my personal belief, if you find a, a soy milk that's made with, with whole soybeans, which are several brands out there, several brands of tofu out there, all that kind of stuff that's made with whole organic soybeans, that it, there has been, it, not that I have found any, there have not been any negative studies regarding moderate consumption. And as a matter of fact, there have been a lot of positive studies, oddly enough, more for men than women, um, towards the consumption of whole soy products. So I, I do think as long as you seek out the right products, you're doing good. Yeah, and if you want, we've got Soya Bella here from TriBest. And if you guys want one, send me an email. I, you can make your own whole soy milk and nut milks. I made my own almond milk the other day. So it's great to make your own. It just tastes incredible. Yeah. Um, you know, and I, I want to ask you about some of the replacements too, but I wrote down because I, I knew my mind went blank for a minute. Um, the other thing I'd read about dairy is that it's mucus forming and a lot of the congestion and phlegm that you might hear in someone's voice is because they're eating too much dairy. Is there anything to back that up? There really aren't a lot of studies to back that up. But, but as I mentioned before, there's a lot of doctors who do um, still recommend cutting out dairy when people have those issues. And there definitely are a lot of people who say they get relief from that. The studies are not big and controversial. 
like, you know, like so many things. There's some that say it helps, some that say it doesn't. So if people want scientific proof, I don't think it's there yet. But if they want to try it and see if it works for them, I have heard hundreds of stories of people that it, it worked for. Yeah, it's interesting how much health information is out there. And when you because we did the same thing for our book, we when we dive into the literature, there's only so much to back up some of the claims that are out there. Well, yeah. And and I think people don't realize studies take funding, too. And so if there's not somebody with a lot of dollars interested in that particular topic, then it may not get researched to the full extent. So, you know, give it a choice, you know, give it a chance, try it for yourself. So let's talk about some of the replacements out there, some of the dairy replacements and some suggestions that you might have, because you say it's, it's not as difficult as people think. Is that true? I don't think it is. I do think they're like everything else. There's a, you know, a hump you've got to go over at first, you know, and then almost everybody I know, once they stick with something, it just becomes second nature. And it, it truly is that way of dairy free. I know there's people looking probably out there just thinking I'm insane, <laughs> but it truly is uh, become second nature and very easy. So what are some of the first steps for someone if they're trying to make changes? What, what would you recommend? What I always recommend is to just stop thinking about dairy right at the onset. Don't think about the alternatives. Don't think about dairy at all. Think about all of the wonderful foods that don't contain dairy. Think about all of the wonderful meals that don't contain dairy and build a meal plan around those things. If you still love to have your cereal every day, I think that alternatives like like milk alternatives are pretty seamless, you know, and most people can find one that they like. And like you said, homemade ones. I've heard that that, that brand um, of, uh, um, I didn't know that was a try best, but I heard it's amazing. Um, yeah, that homemade is just fantastic, too. Um, I think milk alternatives an easy one to replace, but I try not to recommend people dive right into cheese alternatives, sour cream alternatives, you know, eat some Asian food, try some things like jambalaya, you know, homemade jambalaya, try some foods that are naturally dairy free, put those into your diet first. And it, because there are just so many of them, I mean, just so many. And then then when you want to start expanding your repertoire and you want to experiment with those things, you've kind of broken the whole dairy spell. Your, your taste buds aren't thinking blue cheese, you know, they're, they're, they're ready to try something new, if that makes sense. But what about the cravings? Cause in that, inevitably someone's mm-hmm. going to say, okay, but it's almost like an addiction. We might want to yeah. crave some of the pancakes or eggs or, or well, I don't know if we're saying eggs, but <laughs> some of the other things that go in the dairy category and how do you handle the cravings? Well, I think, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a big proponent of, you know, cold Turkey personally, because that really is with anything you're addicted to the easiest, the best and most efficient way is just cold Turkey, you know, and that's why I say meal planning. Um, because the one thing I say is the easiest way to overcome cravings is to not be hungry. If you're hungry, you're going to give in. If you're, if you've got some great food sitting there, you're not even going to think twice about it. Um, and it, but if you just can't handle it, then there definitely are a lot of alternatives. Definitely. I mean, pancakes are a great one. I mean, gosh, dairy free pancakes are so easy and so amazing. Vegan pan, I mean, without eggs and dairy, they're, they're great, you know? And so I think finding this stepping into fulfilling those cravings, but not trying to go too extreme like grandma's casserole. That's usually made with a pound of cheese and a container of sour cream. You know, I see people literally jump right into dairy free and try to just replace all those really dairy heavy recipes right away. And I say, if you're going to go with the cravings, try start, start with ones that aren't so reliant on dairy. That makes sense. What about like things like tofu scrambles? Are those better replacements for, uh, you know, eggs with heavy cheeses on them and things like that? Oh, yes. I mean, you know, tofu scrambles are wonderful. I think people definitely are missing something if they haven't tried those yet. (laughs) Well, the website is GoDairyFree.org and you've got lots of recipes up there to share, which is amazing. These look really good and and they're all for free up there on the website under recipes. So check that out at GoDairyFree.org. We'll have a link to that under the show notes at Juice Crew Radio uh, as well. And the book too, uh, Go Dairy Free. There's a link to it on her website. You can get it up on Amazon. But your book's got lots of recipes in there too. Do you want to talk about what you got in there? 
Oh, sure. Yeah, we've got, um, it's got over 250 recipes. And you mentioned um, the eggs too, because eggs, as I mentioned, coexist with the dairy concerns so much. Every recipe in there actually has, um, if it's not already egg-free, it has an egg-free alternative and a plant-based alternative. So everything's completely friendly for that. Um, I, it's got a huge milk alternative section. I actually tested 25 different types of homemade milk alternatives um, and tested them all in coffee too to see if they'd work as creamers, um, included all of that information as well as recipes for the best ones, the ones that I thought turned out best, homemade alternatives for every recipe that you that you have, um, sour creams, cheeses, sweetened condensed milks, and then of course the full recipes. We got pancakes in there for sure. Um, they're wonderful and, um, and uh, lots of meals, desserts. Um, it's kind of like your, it, it, what I tried to do was include every recipe that you could think of that you might need for the transition, as well as just for sort of those everyday living emergencies, you know, birthday parties, that kind of thing. So it, it's meant to really take you through the transition and beyond. Well, it's really comprehensive. So go ahead and have a look at that. Again, the website's godairyfree.org. Elisa Fleming doing incredible work over there to go dairy free. And are you finding, Elisa, when people start to eliminate dairy, that they're also wanting to give up meat and maybe eat more of a plant-based diet? Is that what you're finding? Yeah, for sure. I think I think it makes people become more aware of the food they're eating and and, and they also become more interested in experimentation too. Did it do the same for you? Did you decide to give up meat when you went this route or was that something you're still including? Um, I actually, I became very curious myself too. And I, um, I did go completely vegan for a while and now I have more of a plant-based diet, but not a strict vegan diet. But I did, I did uh, end up trialing the vegan diet for a while too. Well, it's all about being plant strong, getting more of the plant foods in your body. And we like to do it here at Juice Crew Radio by telling you, get that juice in your body, body, start the day with a fresh cold pressed green juice. Um, you're going to feel incredible. And it's about eating less. We eat ourselves to death in this culture. So eating less, we live longer. We're overfed and undernourished, like Dr. Joel Furman says. Alisa, thank you so much for being here on the show. Anything you wanted to share in general to help our friends transition to a more dairy-free diet and start giving up and making this transition just to see for themselves how they like it. I mean, do you, do you recommend trying it for three weeks and seeing how you feel or wh- how do you want to uh, wrap it up? Um, well, I actually have a dairy free journal I provide online that if people want to try it out, it's a, it's a 10 day trial because I always say that's from what I researched about 10 days is when you should start feeling better if it's going to help you. So I think a, a trial where you plan out what you're going to eat is usually the easiest way to do it. Awesome. Again, it's Elisa Fleming right here on Juice Crew Radio. Go ahead and type in any questions if you have any. Um, We'll be checking throughout the replay, so just let me know, and we'll get to that. I'll I'll share it with Elisa. But, Elisa, thank you again for being on the show. It was really great, and thank you for spreading this information. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Thank you. I'm Steve Prusak, and we'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to Juice Guru Radio. Find out more about us at JuiceGuru.com. Until next time, get your juice on.